ancient one. Hearest thou my voice still? Hey guys, Thing Fishy here. So make your character, choose the Prophet class, and grab the Golden Seed as your starting item. So while we run to Torum, let's talk about this video. Welcome to the most ridiculous and possibly the most fun build I've made so far in Elden Ring. This is an arcane faith build based around Dragon Communion incantations. Now, I've been wondering since the game's release about whether it was possible to do a playthrough of Elden Ring using only Dragon Communion incantations without it turning into a rage-inducing challenge run. My suspicion was that it probably wasn't. So when I started this run, my plan was to use a Dragon Communion incantation at least once against each boss and do the more serious damage with the more grown-up Dragon Cult incantations, such as Lightning Strike and Lightning Spear. As it turned out though, not only is it possible to play through the entire game with just Communion incantations, but it's also hilariously overpowered. There were probably more no-hit fights and first-try bosses in this run than in any of my other build guides so far and pretty much every boss fight ended with me laughing to myself about how powerful this build is. Now because I didn't think at the start of the run that this build would actually work, there's a few things in the early and mid game that I didn't get until much later. Happily, with the power of editing, you'll be getting these right at the start. So despite how broken the fights you're going to see in the early game in this video are, you're actually going to be doing more damage than me if you try this build yourself. So let's talk setup. As usual for this run, I followed my standard setup route, link to the video and full play along in the description, grabbing the sacred tears and upgrades in Weeping, the Golden Seeds, more upgrades, and Radagon Sorcil in Kaelid, and heading to Lyurnia and the Altus Plateau for some Smithing Stone weapon upgrades. The Smithing Stones are optional for this run, but it does make one particular fight a whole lot easier. Now while you're doing this setup, there's a couple of things that you want to grab along the way. When you're at the Church of Pilgrimage in Weeping, drop down the cliff to the south and grab the Faith Knot Tear. Also in Weeping, drop down these stones to the west of the Kalu Baptismal Church and kill this Scarab for the Lightning Strike Incantation. We're only going to use this for one enemy, but it makes life a whole lot easier. On your way to the Putrefied Ruins Teleporter in Leonia, take a little detour into this ruin and down into the cellar to grab the Faith Talisman. While you're grabbing your weapon upgrades in the Celia Crystal Tunnel, be sure to grab the Faithful's Canvas Talisman from the body in the last room. So we pick up the action here, near the Artist Shack, on the east coast of Leonia. We need to kill this knight for the prayer book that he drops. Now you can do this at base stats like me, or you can come back later after Cavalry and Grail. Then head to EG to upgrade your finger seal. If you've done my full setup, you can take it all the way to plus 16, but it's only for literally one enemy, so it doesn't matter that much. Now head to Lena's Rise and make it night. Jump onto the side of the bridge and wait for the Cavalry to do his jump attack and yeet himself off then use his runes to level up at the Grace. Now head to the Altus Plateau, all the way to Mount Gelmir. Head along to where the invader spawns and grab the Golden Vow incantation from this shack. Now we're gonna head into the Hero's Grave right at the start of the game to get our main weapon for the whole run. 
run down the corridors making sure to perfectly dodge all of the chariots. When you get down to the bottom you're going to head this way up to the room with the banished knight in it. Buff up and then run in and catch flame him for the dragon communion seal. Now head back to Dragonborough. Equip Radagon Saw Seal and the Morning Star. Apply your bleed grease to it and start hacking away at Grail. Reapply the grease when it runs out halfway through, then pop the pickled foul foot just as Grail dies. Now head back to the round table and buy a lightning spear from Corin. Then dump all of Grail's runes into your arcane. Now we're going to nip back to Weeping Peninsula, to the nearby Rise. Kill the three dogs, then grab an extra memory stone at the top. Then walk to EG and level up your new seal to plus six. Now head back to the first step. Memorize Lightning Spear and equip the Dragon Communion Seal. Ride out to the lake and bully Argeel. Now head to South Caled, all the way to the Church of the Dragon Communion. Light the Grace, then buy Argeel's Flame, Dragon Moor, and Grail's Roar. While we're in Caled, head to Fort Gale, light the Grace, and ride around the side of the building to get the Flame Grant Me Strength incantation. Now to the Ball Prawn Shack, and head towards the Minor Ur Tree. Parkour up the rise, falling off at least once of course, and grab the memory stone at the top. Now it's time for Margit. At the grace before him, memorize Dragon Moor and Flame Grant Me Strength, and equip the Faith Talisman. Equip your flasks with the Dexterity and Faith tiers. Before you go in, cast Golden Vow and Flame Grant Me Strength. We're going to be doing this for the whole run. Now the main source of damage for this build is going to be Dragon Maw. Dragon Maw deals physical damage and deals the largest amount of poise damage I believe in a single hit in the entire game. So think of it like a giant charged R2. Because of this, there are two ways of fighting with it. The first and the most simple is just hit and hope while an enemy is idling. It has better range than almost any melee weapon and it also has ridiculous poise through the animation. So for bosses who don't do a lot of damage, you can just brute force it. The safer approach is, of course, to wait for an opportunity. Margit's jump attack is perfect for this, so wait for that and hit Dragon Maw after he lands. Level up, equip the canvas talisman in your new slot, and run through Stormvale in the usual way. Light the secluded cell grace, then quickly go grab the cracked pots from the pot friends nearby. Now it's time for Godric. For the safest possible Godric fight, wait until he does his tornado attack. Cast Dragon Maw just as he goes over your head. Two Dragon Maws will take him to phase two. Run up to him at the start of phase two and get two more free ones, then the fight's over. Pop his remembrance and level up. Now head to Rhea Lucaria for Red Wolf. Now Margit and Godric both had lots of attacks with very slow recoveries, giving us plenty of opportunity for Dragon Maw. Red Wolf and a lot of other bosses however, don't. So this is the first fight where you want to stand just outside of his melee range and hit Dragon Maw while he's idling. Level up, grab the golden seed in the courtyard, and head to Renala. Punch the sweetings to stop them spawning all over the place, and hit Renala with two dragon moors. Buff up after hitting the sixth sweeting, and end the fight with a single hit. For phase two, run straight up to her and slightly to her side to cast dragon moor, so you don't get hit by Comet Azur. Two hits will almost kill her, and you can chuck a lightning spear at her for the win. 
pop her remembrance and level up. Now we're going to backtrack to Limgrave to the Saintsbridge Grace. Jump down and into the cave to kill the Golem for the Blue Dancer Charm. Grab the third talisman pouch from Enya and equip this. Now head to the Boil Prawn Shack. Head southeast to Raya, back to the shack for her necklace, then back to her for the invitation. Head up the Dectus Lift to take her hand to get to Volcano Manor. Speak to Tanith and head through the dungeon to Godskin. For this fight, stand just out of reach and cast Dragon Maw after his combos. Getting him stuck on a pillar while he's rolling is a great opportunity for another one. You'll find yourself staggering him quite a bit for this fight, so just stay on top of your FP and it's a very easy one. Now before Rykard, head back to the round table and buy two stone sword keys. Run through the dungeon, through the stone sword key gate to grab the somber smithing seven. You can now head back to the blacksmith and level your seal to plus nine. Then through the dungeon again to get to Rykard's grace. As always, equip the strength physic, Radagon sword seal, put the lance in your right hand and then serpent hunter in your left for the crouching poke strategy. Now, as always on a low health and defense character, we should be fine here, just as long as he doesn't open with the Okay, so either that was the most ridiculous bad luck in the history of gaming, or patch 1.07 has made that attack a little more likely. Let me know if you guys are seeing that attack more, because that's never happened to me. Crouch L1 him through both phases to stun him out of all of the dangerous stuff. Pop his remembrance and level up. Now as this is a bit of a challenge build, and his remembrance is very valuable, head to the walking mausoleum in Weeping, clean its feet, duplicate the remembrance and pop it for some extra levels. Now walk to Leonia and ride over to the Glintstone Dragon and spam a lightning spear at its head. Now back to the Cathedral of Dragon Communion and out to do the same for the Rock Dragon. Then back to the altar to buy Big Rock Breath. Now it's time for Altus and the Draconic Tree Sentinel. Buff up at the stake, then use Big Rock Breath on him for a Rock Proc. Now for one of the most satisfying Tree Sentinel strats in the game. Parry the jumping attack, then straight into a Dragon Maw. Dragon Maw will stun him out of all of his attacks, so this is completely safe. Level up and head through Lendale to the Avenue Balcony Grace. Go back, buff up and bully the Avatar. While heading through the capital, head up to the Colosseum for the Ritual Shield Talisman. We're going to equip this and keep it for the whole game. Now for Godfrey. And in theory, there are almost no openings in this fight big enough for a Dragon Maw but using it while he's idling and preparing to dodge as soon as it hits, you can make them. Three hits is all it takes. Pop the Lord's Rune you got from the Avatar and a Golden Rune 9 to round it up and level up at the Grace. Now it's time for Morgoth. This is another ridiculously easy fight. One Dragon Maw will trigger the dagger attack. The second will stun him out of that attack. The third to trigger phase two, and the fourth to kill him while he transforms. Now head to the mountaintops of the giants. 
head over the bridge Okay, head over the bridge and all the way to Fire Giant. Now this fight is super easy with Dragon Maw. Just spam it whenever you can at his foot for phase one. For phase two, get two on the hand at the start and you should get a stagger on one of these or one more on his leg. If you do, don't do what I did and miss the opportunity to Dragon Maw the Eye. Two more and a cheeky lightning spear will end the fight. I hate this game. Only I could make a build guide where we end up fighting Phase 2 Fire Giant with a plus zero spear. Yeah, maybe have one extra flask available in case you miss some Dragon Maws. Level up at the forge and burn the Ur tree to head to Farron. As usual, we head through the dungeon to the Dragon Temple Transept Grace, before heading back to the Boiled Prawn Shack and south into the village of the Albanurix for any extra mushrooms and Centrina's lilies that we need, and the first half of the secret medallion. Then nip back to Kale at the Church of Ella in Limgrave for the crafting kit and the crack pots, then to the Saints Bridge Merchant for one more cracked pot. Walk back to the Transept Grace, craft the sleep pots and put little and large to sleep. This is a super easy duo sleep fight. Three Dragon Moors will kill each of them, it's as simple as that. Head through the rest of the dungeon picking up the ancient somber stone from behind the dragon, then head up to the grace. Go plus 10 your weapon, kill the draconic tree sentinel on the bridge with the same strategy as before, rock breaths then parries into dragon moors. And head to south Kaelid, ride into the swamp to the stake of Marika by Commander O'Neill. Buff up and ride straight up to him and hit him with three Dragon Moors for the win. Take the unalloyed needle to Gallery to be fixed. Give it to Millicent to stab herself with. Then talk to her back at Gallery's shack. Level up, then head to Redmain Castle for Radan. As usual, we ride backwards at the start of the fight to despawn him, then buff up as he runs towards you. We have a plus 10 seal and massive damage, so he's going to go down very easily. Pop his rune and level up. Now for this run we're going to do Millicent's entire questline to get an incantation boosting talisman. So head back to Altus and all the way north to the Shaded Castle. Up the ladder to the second level and left all the way to this tower to grab the Valkyrie's prosthesis. Give this to Millicent at her new location by the Erd Tree Gazing Hill, then head north to the windmill village and kill the godskin apostle. Three dragon moors will kill him. Now speak to Millicent and speak to her once more at the Snow Valley Ruins Grace. I don't know if speaking to her here is actually required, I suspect it's not, but do it anyway. Now I've never shown this skip in one of my guides before, but as it still works on 107, why not? Head to the Snow Valley Overlook Grace and ride north to this point on the cliff. From here, double jump onto this treetop, then another double jump down to Castle Sol. You can now run straight into Nile without having to deal with any of the teleporting banished knights. Nile is very easy on this build. First, one shot the right summon, 
Then bunch up the other one and the commander like this and do a fully charged big rock breath to kill the second summon and inflict rot on the commander. For the rest of the fight, you can bait this little tornado attack and use Dragon Maw just outside of the AoE. Grab the other half of the secret medallion and head to the rolled lift. Ride through the snowfield all the way to Ordener Town. Again, I'm using Ordener Skip here as it still works on 107. But you can check out my faith guide for the light roll strategy if this gets patched in the future. Jump up on the pillar, line up your compass to the right of this notch and do two jumps with the direction order being 12 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Run through the halic tree, grab the shortcut near Loretta, then head in. Now in theory, this fight should be a nightmare. We usually kill Loretta a lot later than this in the runs. But just like the other sentinel enemies, either use parries into dragon moors, or wait for those big blue combos to get a dragon moor in the recovery. You could also use big rock breath at the start like we did in the faith guide. But with the amount of damage that we're putting out, we don't have to play too well for this to be quite a manageable fight. Level up, then so we don't lose 50k runes, kill this knight to round up to another level. Then speak to Millicent by the grace. Run all the way through Elphiel until you get to the drainage channel grace. Here you want to memorise Argeel's flame. And then we're going to double back on ourselves and head towards the roots again. To this area here to fight the rotten tree spirit. Honestly, whoever thought of putting one of these things here was utterly evil. Run into the rot to trigger the fight, then stand on this ledge for a charged flame. Then run up onto this upper level to cast more. The spirit kind of gets stuck on the ledge here, so you're mostly safe. Try and cast your breath attacks in the air so his tail swipe can't hit you. When it's dead, you can head over to the two summon signs. Now, I'd highly advise you fight Millicent here. It's a whole lot easier. However, if you killed her on a recent playthrough and feel guilty, or you just want to torture yourself, you can help her. If you decide to help her, the best strat is to jump off the ledge and into the air to rain fire down from above. All of the invaders will two-shot you at this level, so you want to stay well clear of them. Afterwards, speak to Millicent, sob uncontrollably, wonder why you do this to yourself, and head back to Caelid, to Gowry's shack. You'll find him here, crying over Millicent's death. Be a good person, and console him. He drops the best incantation talisman in the game, once again Miyazaki is the monster here. Now it's time to head underground. First off, head down to the Ancestral Woods and light the fires to head into Moose. He takes three hits. Even if he fully heals, one more Dragon Maw will kill him. Oh, Honestly, what is wrong with this game today? Now head to the Gargoyles. While you're buffing up, remember all of the times that these two have bullied you in the past. Remember all of the appalling RNG and poison spams they've given you, so you can take the greatest amount of joy in two-shotting both of them. Head through deep root depths and light the bonfire near Fia's champions. Before we fight them, walk back to Lyurnia and into Caria Manor for Loretta. We've just two-shot the gargoyles and killed the real Loretta already, so this really isn't going to be a problem. Speak to Rani, head into the Knight's Sacred Ground for the Finger Slayer Blade, back to Rani for the Inverted Statue, then to the Karian Study Hall and up to the top for the Curse Mark of Death. Now for Fia's Champions, and if there's one boss in this run that's going to really annoy you, it's likely to be these nerds. Dragon Maw will one-shot all of them, but despite Patch 107 adding more of a hitbox to it, it still can miss them if you're unlucky. 
We don't have much health, so make sure that you do your best to fight them separately. Now it's time for Fortis Axe. At the start of the fight, run up to him and do a Dragon Maw just as his head drops for a strong headshot opener. Only three more attacks and the fight is over. Now use the teleporter in Renner's Rise and head through Ainzel River for Estelle. Estelle is also a complete joke. Four attacks for the win. Now head back to Farum. Pop a remembrance to round up your levels and use all of the Balderkin's blessings in your inventory as we need all the health we can get. Now for Malekith. Beast Clergyman is actually pretty dangerous for this build as he can combo you to death while you're in the air. But as he only takes three attacks to kill, you won't find this much of a problem. Make sure you drink a blue flask before hitting him for the third time. Now for the Malaketh opening, roll the sword, then do a Dragon Maw. If you drank your flask before you killed Beast, you can do one more here to end the fight without fighting him at all. If you're an idiot like me, drink a bluey and find space for one more. Pop a golden rune 10 at the grace and level up. Buff up outside Gideon's door, then pop an exalted flesh just to make sure that we won't have to actually fight him. Run in and spam three dragon moors. God, I love this build. Now time for Godfrey. Now like the shade version, there isn't technically enough time to safely hit him between his combos here. However, bait the jump and cast Dragon Moor as the axe lands. You can run away from the earthquake attack and cast as soon as you're clear. By the time you actually attack, he'll be there. And use the stomp attack as an opportunity for one more. At the start of the Horalu fight, walk backwards to avoid the grab, then Dragon Maw. Then you can use your light rolls to create distance away from the combos and attack as they're ending. There's room for another during the stomp windup and poise through whatever he does next for that final hit. Level up and now it's time for Radar Beast. I was actually planning on going and getting Theodorix's breath for the Radagon fight. But as soon as Dragon Maw is so ridiculously powerful, we'll save that for another guide. Get two in at the start, one after his jump attack, and one after dodging the triple slam. Now for Elden Beast. This is another very easy fight. We do big damage and enough posture damage to go for stagger strategies. Just make sure you're close enough to hit him for the repost and the follow-up, otherwise you're just wasting your FP. The damage and posture damage is so good here that with the right RNG you can kill Elden Beast in the most satisfying way possible, by staggering him and killing him whilst tanking Elden Stars. Oh come on, don't do this to me again. Why do I do this to myself? Oh, okay, thank God for that. Had enough for a little lightning at the end. Nearly had to get the plus zero spear out again. Level up and head to the Altus Plateau to bully Eleonora for the purifying tear. Now warp to Ordinar Town and head southwest. Jump onto this ledge to cheese the invader and run through Mogwin Palace. Equip the purifying tier at the Grace, then head up to Moog. Moog is very easy for this build. The amount of damage we do per hit means that we can quite easily get him well below half health before he knee heals. I actually think that with the right FP management, you could one cycle him here. Let me know if any of you guys manage it. Get one hit after he finishes knee heal and then one more to end the fight. 
Well, at least I have some FP this time, so I don't have to get the spear out. Now for Melania. And you might think that she'd be an absolute nightmare with such a slow build. But you're wrong. For phase one, Hit her with two Dragon Moors at the start for an almost guaranteed Waterfowl. You can dodge the first part with either three light rolls backwards or simply running. Then the second part with the three rolls, one o'clock, one o'clock, six o'clock. The rest of phase one is pretty easy as her constant idling gives you plenty of room for Dragon Moors. Phase two is a little more difficult as she doesn't idle as much but just be ready to use Dragon Maw when she gives you an opportunity. As always, the flower attack and her jump attacks are great opportunities for this. If you floor her on the first one, you have room for three in total. And finally, it's quite fitting that the most difficult boss of the Dragon Run is the Dragon Lord himself. Plassey has so much health and give so little opportunity for damage that this becomes an endurance fight where I'd say you need at least six blue flasks leaving you with minimal healing options. If you're not comfortable with this fight I'd highly recommend seeking out more golden seeds for flask refills than I have here. At the start of the fight he does four lightning strikes. Taking three of these will kill you. So while he's casting hit him with three dragon balls. You can afford to tank two of the lightning hits to do this. He'll then stagger and you can get a Dragon Maw on the head for big damage. Now unlike pretty much every other build in the game, we don't have quite enough time to hit him after he's teleporting claw attacks. Trying to do this will result in you wasting your precious FP. And you definitely don't want to be fighting Plassey with an unupgraded spear. Wait for his slower attacks to cast Dragon Maw. This flame attack that he does is a great opportunity to get two in and finish the fight. If you've missed a few Dragon Maws, you might need a cheeky lightning spear at the end. Oh god. And that's it. How to create a super powerful dragon communion build in Elden Ring. If you've made it this far and have actually tried this build, please let me know how you got on in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave me a comment with a future build guide suggestion and subscribe to my channel for more Elden Ring build guides. As always, thanks for watching. See you soon.